Thank you very much for your excellent work and your visionary talk and your attentiveness to time, um, the present and the future. Um, I, we're going to shift gears now to have a, a panel discussion, and let me just introduce everyone uh, one at a time. Sort of short presentations with no slides, and I just want to check uh, how John Ionidis is presenting. Is he? He's online. Okay, welcome. So our three presenters are uh, Jennifer uh, Geeter, who's a partner at uh, McDermott, Will, and Emery. Uh, John Ionides, pardon me if I mispronounce that, uh, who's a professor at uh, Stanford, and Kelly Edwards, who's associate dean and a professor at University of Washington. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I, I feel a little bit like my, I think it's my son Sesame Street of which one of us is not like the other as I look at the amazing scientific credentials of folks who are here. And I may be the lone private bar attorney invited to join. And so I really appreciate the opportunity to come and speak with you. I think I have a slightly unique role. Uh, I was asked to have a slightly unique role in the day's presentation to talk generally about some of the challenges that we're seeing from a, a wide range of stakeholders, academic medical centers, community hospitals, pharmaceutical companies, uh, biotech, uh, and some of the legal and regulatory uh, challenges and opportunities that surround the work that you're trying to do and to sort of touch on a, a few items very, very briefly. And I'm happy to explore these with you in greater detail you know, during lunch. Um, the first is that I think we have some competing public priorities. Uh, the, the, the stakeholder that we've, one of the stakeholders that I haven't heard about so far has been the public and their demand for biomedical innovation. They go into the doctor's office, they want a new treatment, especially for conditions where uh, the treatments are lagging behind or, or having difficulty cracking that nut. Um, the public can be very powerful in pushing for data sharing and for biomedical innovation, but at the same time, the public remains deeply afraid about privacy. Uh, it's hard to understand exactly what they are afraid about. Are they afraid that their information will be used in ways that they don't intend? Are they afraid that their information will be used in ways that have adverse employment or insurance consequences? It's, it's difficult to know. Uh, but everyone out there perceives a real privacy concern. And so you have a disagreement within the public about what our default settings, so to speak, should be with respect to data sharing. And, and one default setting would be a presumption of non-access, uh, where in general the data stays at rest, it's only used for a limited purpose, and you'd have to overcome a presumption to have access to that data. The best example would be your classic doctor-patient relationship. This protects privacy, it errs on the side of protecting privacy, but obviously is a significant impediment to data sharing. The second model would be sort of a rules of the road model. You expect the cars on the highway to be driving, but there's an agreement about whether the on-ramps are on the left side or the right side and what side you drive on and what speed you can go. You start with a presumption that the data can move and you focus your energies not on stopping the data, putting it at rest, but creating some safe driving rules. And in listening to, to my clients and coming to conferences and teaching at Georgetown, I, I hear both. I, I see both in the newspaper on the same page uh, from sometimes the same constituents. So I think partly what you're trying to do is you're trying to do something in an environment in which there's some public ambivalence. And if there are ways to resolve that public ambivalence, uh, then I think you'll have a real cheerleader for some of the data sharing that you're trying to do. You also have a legal uncertainty challenge. Uh, so first of all, there are active rulemakings going on right now that specifically touch data sharing. Uh, the first 
is active rulemaking for a final rule under the HIPAA standards. And the HIPAA standards really, oh, I'm sorry. it's okay, thank you. Um, the HIPAA standards really matter for what you're trying to do because they control research activities when even it's just the data that's in play. You don't have to have a real life person in front of you. You don't even have to be gathering new information. If you're looking at existing data and that data is above a certain level of identifiability, which is actually fairly low, uh, then HIPAA is going to be uh, in play. And why I say that identifi identifiability standard is pretty low is that dates of service alone, without any other information, um, render that information identifiable. So if I, see, if I say that a patient was treated uh, for schizophrenia on uh, October 1st, 2012, and I tell you nothing else, um, and I am speaking as a covered entity, I'm a healthcare provider, I have shared protected health information and I can only do that in a way that HIPAA permits. And HIPAA does have specific uh, data provisions. Uh, we expect a final rule to come out any day. The proposed rule came out in July of 2010. So we have been waiting for that rule every day uh, for several years. I've given up predicting because I've been wrong every time. Um, but eventually it will come out. It's statutorily required. And in the proposed rule, which really wasn't focused on data sharing, buried in the middle were some really important changes with respect to data sharing that would conform HIPAA to the rules that perhaps the pharmaceutical industry is more familiar with, general research principles. Uh, the second major form of uncertainty, and I just really want to stress this, is rulemaking right now to change the common rule. Just by a show of hands, how many folks in here know what I mean when I say the common rule? Okay, so that's great. So sometimes when I speak to pharmaceutical and device manufacturers, they're not as familiar with it because they don't do federally sponsored research, so they haven't had to live within that environment. Um, that rule is getting a uh, massive upgrade for the 21st century, and we're only at the advanced notice stage, so we have two more cycles to go. But there were some really important changes, proposed changes, with respect to rulemaking. And one uh, was whether or not biospecimens, human biospecimens, could ever be considered de-identified. Right now, if you strip away enough information and all you have is a piece of tissue, it's not a human subject anymore. If you say that that information can never be de-identified because it contains genetic material, you lose that, that safe harbor of sorts. And obviously there's a huge debate within the scientific community about whether that's forward-looking and that eventually there will be enough cross-referenceable genetic information that that's a sensible standard. And then obviously folks on the other side say, if you take away the ability to de-identify biospecimens, how are we supposed to do uh, future research with it? How are we supposed to share information? Another important I'm not sure how to, oh, there we go. Another important uh, regulatory thing is we have a lack of harmonization. On data sharing specifically, the FDA, the common rule, and HIPAA do not agree. Uh, they approach this topic differently. The FDA, for example, is used to doing trials where you have a real live person in front of you. Um, they, are, they are less accustomed to trials in which you are using leftover biospecimens. They do not have in their regulations, for example, a carve out that if the tissue is de-identified, it's no longer a human subject, or for example, the ability to get an IRB waiver. So far, the FDA has dealt with this issue with enforcement discretion, meaning we agree that what you're doing is a violation of our regs, but we're not going to enforce those regulations under certain limited circumstances. But it means when you are doing data sharing trial preparation, in the United States at least, you could be referencing at least three federal rules and perhaps state-by-state uh, state rules, and those state-by-state state rules tend to be disease-specific. The analogy I always give is it's like when you cut a tree, and you can see the, the, the drought years and the really wet years by, based on the size of the rings. It's a little bit similar with state law. You can see when we were concerned about HIV, HIV regulations come onto the state radar. We can see when we're concerned about mental health, those regulations come on, and they differ by state. Um, and the last uh, legal uncertainty point I just want to mention is the ongoing uncertainty about Part 11, which is um, electronic data vis-a-vis -vis FDA submissions. As I'm sure all of you know, certain parts of Rule 11 are currently enforced, certain uh, rules aren't. The reason I think this relates to data sharing is principally when you guys are doing data sharing, you're doing it with electronic data um, and want to be able to use that electronic data in your future submissions. 
I'm talking, I feel like I'm an auctioneer here talking as fast as I can. Um, a few, <laughs> you guys are gonna have to slow down the tape, it's gonna be like a chip, the old chip mix when you listen to the audio recording. Um, on the biomedical invasion, a, a couple of uh, quick things. The prep to research exception, by show of hands, how many people know what that is? Okay, so fewer. Hey, um, the prep to research exception is a really important HIPAA pathway that allows you to mine data in order to prepare trials. So we're talking a lot about data sharing for actually running your trials, but if you want to mine that data to say, hey, are our different data sets compatible? Do we think we could do the types of collaborations you're discussing? Do we think we have enough patients at a particular center to enroll them on a trial? This is typically the pathway you want to use if you are a covered entity. Uh, but here's the hook. To use the preparatory to research pathway, the data cannot leave the premises of the covered entity. This made sense when you were looking at dusty paper medical records. It doesn't make as much sense, in my view, when you're talking about electronic data that may never be at the covered entity's premises to begin with, uh, because it may be maintained by a cloud computing EHR vendor or a remote EHR service provider, by a business associate, by any number of uh, assistant players that, that should be housing those EHRs. Another important thing uh, are the CLIA lab rules. Um, they are going to regulate laboratory developed tests and they also are not harmonized. And one of the, the rules of CLIA is that if you are conducting research on a new laboratory developed test, you cannot share the results with the patients enrolled or their physicians until, that test, until you validate the test and then rerun the test. So imagine being a physician who says to a family, we want to enroll your child in a clinical trial, it's a very rare condition. We may see a signal of what's going on that could affect your decision to have future children, how you might treat this child, but we're not going to be able to tell you. Um, I think this is uh, not intuitive to folks who do research a lot of time who may suspend sharing results for a short period of time while the trial is going on, but assume eventually they can data share with the patient. CLIA takes uh, a different approach. And then with respect to con contractual constraints for multi-institutional collaborations, let me just run through a couple. Um, one is competing ownership provisions. We have the data that comes into the trial, but we also have the thoughts and the discussions and the ideas and what other trial we could do and how you write those provisions. There's often a, a real disconnect between the scientists and the tech transfer and the IP groups within the hospital. So when we talk about stakeholders, it's institutional stakeholders, but then it's stakeholders inside the stakeholders. And make sure that you're talking to all the ones you, you need. I've seen many, many times you get through to the physicians, you may even get through to a vice chair for research, and then you come, come to a grinding halt with the IP council, uh, with the IRB, um, with other types of stakeholders. Um, think about how the trial will be paid for and how funds will be shared, not just to stakeholders, but stakeholders within stakeholders. Uh, when you're dealing with academic medical centers, you may be dealing with a faculty model, uh, but as you branch out to different types of institutional settings, that won't necessarily be the case, and the doctors are expecting to be paid uh, for the time and effort um, that, they, that they spend. Um, and then finally, I would say, really think about the scope. What question are you asking? How broad do you want this collaboration to be? Is it every trial about diabetes? Is it certain trials about diabetes? Are you going to have a scientific board? And how are you going to avoid cherry picking? They don't want to bring the ones where they, they might have real IP, uh, fruitful IP down the line, and so the collaboration tends to get watered down. What type of structural protections can you build into the contract for the rainy day? I mean, one of my hardest jobs as an attorney is that when these types of collaborations are brought to me, everyone's really excited about them. And everyone has great hope for them, and no one wants to talk about what happens if you guys stop playing well in the sandbox. Uh, but oftentimes people stop playing well in the sandbox, not just toddlers. Um, and if you can try to build in some stop gaps along the way to right your ship as you go, that would be great. Can I talk for one more minute? OK, yes, 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 sir. Um, I'm going to in be indulged and be allowed to talk for one more minute. OK, the last thing I want to talk about is clinical care, because this may not be on your radar because we're thinking about research. But especially with EHRs, the line between clinical care and research continues to blend or bleed or get blurry. Um, and the reason for that is because the, a lot of the data that you guys might want to mine is going to be in EHRs, especially as the EHR standards evolve. 
Um, you can think of the rollout of EHRs as a phased uh, process. We're in two out of three. And the third stage has a lot of the specifications that are about interoperability, that are about data sharing, that are about one system's ability to talk to another. And that's where you can start to have some systematic data collection across institutions. And so you're going to see data collected from clinical studies, uh, clinical care, not necessarily from past research studies, being available for mining. There are going to be certain limitations on that that you're going to want to be aware of. And that's going to be situations in which we, for other competing public priorities, have placed limitations on the ability of that data to be viewed and shared. Um, an example would be uh, patient safety organizations where we want physicians to self-police and we want physicians to um, troubleshoot the, their, the care they've provided and not make that data available and protect it uh, from discovery. So I think you guys are, are asking the right questions, um, and I think you will see as the regulations uh, shake out some, some new questions, but hopefully um, some resolution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.